Well, good morning, Grace City Church, and welcome. Pastor Adam here. Happy to be with you again this Sunday morning. Happy Sunday. Happy Labor Day weekend. So for those of you that are watching this live or maybe you're watching this after the weekend, I want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us. I'm coming to you here from the town of Methow. We're back up the Methow Valley again. A little different setting this time around. We're actually in the Calvary Chapel Fellowship up here in, in Methow. It used to be just the little Methow Community Church where I was born and raised attending church. So pretty crazy to be uh, in this space this morning and uh, excited to be able to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we continue in our series, The One Thing You Need. It's crazy for me to be standing and preaching in this room. This actually is where I preached the first sermon I ever preached in 1998, I was 20 years old, uh, I believe, and uh, preached my first sermon right here. And a little bit different since I was here, but, uh, but just amazing to see and to think about, uh, think about the faithfulness of God through the years in my life and to be able to share this little slice of country church with you. It actually thought about, I've thought about this space a lot when I think about and watch the chapel go up on our property. This is a little white country church, much like the chapel that's being built there that we will enjoy together soon. And so pretty special for me to be in here. Just a huge thanks to Pastor Jason Getson uh, for allowing us uh, to be in here today and, and, to, uh, and to film the message here and, and to bring this message to you today. So this is part four, I believe, in our series that Pastor Josh kicked off a few weeks ago on the Holy Spirit, the one thing you need. And I want to just again set our minds and our hearts around the reality of the moment we are in as we prepare to hear from God's Word and to think through the reality of the importance of the Holy Spirit. And it's simply this, you and I need the Holy Spirit. He really is the one thing we need. In this moment, these are these are crazy days, crazy times. This is unusual for me to be talking to you in this way without being in the room with you. And I, I miss you and I, I look forward to that day and it's coming. But until then, friends, you and I need to be crystal clear on our need for the person of the Holy Spirit to be walking with him and in him. As, as uh, I'll invite you to turn, if you've got a Bible, our home text is going to be in Ephesians 5. We're going to go there in just a moment. So Galatians 5 and then Ephesians 5, that's going to set where we're going this morning as uh, we talk about how to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. How to walk in step with the Holy Spirit. So Galatians chapter 5, we find the passage about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, and Galatians 5.22 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. And then it says this in verse 25, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So that's what I want to talk about this morning. How do you keep in step with the Holy Spirit? We've talked the last several weeks about what the Spirit does in our lives, how He empowers us to honor Jesus. And the dove comes down, the dove lands where the Lamb is lifted up, where Jesus is exalted, where Jesus is honored, and it attracts the, the attention and the happiness and the active presence and ministry of the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit empowers us to honor Him. It creates new desires and hungers and appetites in our lives. It fuels us with hope, even in the midst of trials, adversity, persecution. The Spirit of God humbles us and, and enables us to walk in unity and peace with one another in the body of Christ. And the Spirit of God is given to help you and I in every way as followers of Jesus, especially in our weakness. The same Spirit that empowered Jesus Christ empowers you and I 
to live the Christian life. And so now the question of how do we walk in step with, how do we access those blessings and benefits of the reality of the active presence of the Holy Spirit in our life? Because if you're like me at all, you may have found yourself before, you hear that, you hear, man, what the Spirit does in the lives of Christians, and you hear of the, uh, maybe someone tell a story of, of how he's heard God direct him and guide him and lead him in such a personal and, and specific and special way. And you might find yourself wondering, if that's what the Bible says the Spirit does in our lives, why is my experience so often less than that? Have you ever wondered that? Like, like that sounds amazing. What if, what if we had this indwelling Spirit constantly renewing our hope, this streams of living water flowing from within? Like, that sounds great. How do you tap into that? How do you drop the bucket, Adam? and tap into the constant, free-flowing supply that the Holy Spirit has promised to bring and to give in the lives of Christians. So here's a principle I want to put on the table for us this morning. The principle is this. The Holy Spirit gives stronger or weaker evidence of the presence and blessing of God according to our response to Him. The Holy Spirit gives stronger or weaker evidence of the presence and blessing of God according to our response to Him, which means we can grow in our relationship with the Holy Spirit. We can learn to walk in step with the Holy Spirit, but there are also ways in which, in which we can walk not in step with the Holy Spirit. I told the, the, the story of the, of the man on the cruise ship who spent his whole week eating cheese and crackers in his room, not, not realizing what was available to him and afforded to him, all included with the price of the fare. The reality is, Scripture itself gives us negative responses. And so that's what it, Scripture says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. It's possible to grieve the Holy Spirit. Scripture tells us don't quench the Holy Spirit. It's possible to quench the Holy Spirit. We can insult the Spirit, we read in Hebrews. We even see people in Acts chapter 5 lying to the Holy Spirit. Not recommended, by the way. So there are differing responses that we can give as we learn to walk in step with the Holy Spirit. And those are some of the negative responses we see in Scripture. So there's a way to learn how to keep in step. And that is that process of crucifying the passions of our flesh, not relying on mere natural instincts, but learning to live according to the Word of God, in line with, in tune with, in step with the Spirit of God, guiding and leading and giving stronger evidence of His presence and His ministry and His blessing in our lives. And friends, you and I need to be walking in step with the Holy Spirit. The church that Jesus is building is a Spirit-filled church. It's a church of people who know His voice and follow Him. They know His Word and they know His voice and they walk in tune and in step with the Holy Spirit. And by God's grace, that is who you are, Grace City Church. That's who we are. And that's the call, that's the invitation for us. So, what gets in the way? Well, we get in the way. There's not one of us that doesn't have static on the line and doesn't have things that clog or things that get in the way. In fact, the Bible says we see dimly now, right? We, 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 it takes discipline. It takes sensitivity. It takes practice. It takes learning to listen and hear and walk in step with the Spirit. And so, uh, why, why this is important, I think of, uh, I think of David's, Famous prayer of confession in Psalm 51. And when he has given way to his flesh and, and sin, in his prayer of confession, he says, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. What a fearful thing. Lord, I need your Holy Spirit to know you, to walk with you, to follow you. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Lord, I don't want to grieve your Spirit. I don't want to quench your Spirit. I don't want to ignore your Spirit. I don't want to insult your Spirit. I don't want, I don't want to lie to you. I don't want to feed the flesh and starve the Spirit of God within me. I want, to, I want to learn how to walk in step 
with the Holy Spirit. Of course, in, in Matthew 12, you see the, what is the unforgivable sin? It's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. People wonder, what is that? Have I, have I committed the unforgivable sin? Well, the unforgivable sin is merely unbelief. To persist and continue throughout your life to resist the convicting, calling, wooing work of the Holy Spirit. And so if you're worried about whether or not you've, you've uh, committed the unforgivable sin, good news, the fact that you care shows that you haven't. <laughs> At least yet, it's, if you continue in unbelief. So the call is there to repent, to place your faith in Jesus, to recognize your need for salvation and forgiveness and to come to Christ and to, and to allow the Spirit of God to lead you not just to know Jesus, but then to live the rest of your life walking with Him, with Jesus and with the Spirit. So here's what I want to do this morning. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 5. If you've got a Bible there at home, you can turn there real quick. And we're going to, I'm going to walk through seven steps for me that have been helpful in terms of how to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Seven steps to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Again, not exhaustive. It's not a recipe or formula or lever. It's not like quarters that you put in and you pull this lever and out comes this thing. That's not the way that it works. It's a relationship and the Spirit of God is sovereign and free. It's 100% His prerogative of when He chooses to, to give that greater, stronger evidence or gifting or experience to the, to the child of God. And so, uh, it, it's, it's not a recipe by any means, but seven steps to help you as we consider how to walk in step with the Holy Spirit. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, and I'll begin reading at verse 15 to 21. Paul writes this, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Or literally, it means go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. So he's writing to Christians. He's saying, go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So, first thing I want to say, first step, how to walk in step with the Spirit. The first thing is set your mind and your heart on the things of God. Set your mind and heart on things above. We see also in Romans chapter 8 that those who live according to the Spirit have set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And here we see, say, be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Think carefully and understand what the Lord's will is. So set your mind and heart on things above. And this isn't just a one-time setting. This is, how do you walk in step with the Holy Spirit? Well, you make an active, daily habit, pattern, posture, direction of your life. You, you repeatedly set the direction of your life toward the things of God. Father, I belong to you. Jesus, I live for you. Spirit of God, fill me, use me, show me, guide me. I'm setting my mind and my heart on the things of God. You say, we've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. I, I often think of it, if you've ever seen a, an incredible musician or an incredible athlete, when you take this amazing gift that is given to someone, when you add to that the discipline of practice, 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 there emerges this fluidity and this flow. There's a freedom on the court. There's a freedom at the piano. There's a gift that's been given. And then there's the discipline and the practice added to that. And out of that comes a freedom and a flow and a power and a beauty. And that's much the way it is with the Christian life. You and I have been given this incredible gift of the Holy Spirit. But now we add to that the discipline 
and the practice of setting our minds and hearts on the things of God, on resetting and resetting and resetting our mind and heart on the things of God. And when that gift, bring to that the training yourself and the disciplining yourself toward godliness and towards the Lord, you add some discipline and some habit and some repeated intentional resolve and will engaged in saying, this is where I'm going. And out of that emerges that flow and that fluidity. It's available, it's possible to learn how to walk in tune and in step with the Holy Spirit. Set your minds on things above. Secondly, study Scripture to know God's will and God's way. And you, you saw it there in, in Ephesians 5 where it says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. The more we pack the Word of God into our mind, this is the voice of God. This is the voice of the Spirit. This, this is God breathed. His Spirit has spoken these things. So, What does the voice of the Holy Spirit sound like? Well, it sounds a lot like the Bible. It sounds like Scripture. So when you hear in your mind and in your heart something that is directly taken from here, right? That's, that's a, there's a good chance that might be the Holy Spirit. You want to hear from the Holy Spirit? Pack this in your mind and your heart. Study. Study the Word of God. In other words, we need a biblical framework and filter. Not just some emotional or experiential compass, right? We, we, we must understand that truth leads the way. Theology leads the way. The truth of who God is and what Scripture says within the bounds of Scripture, that is the lane in which you will hear and follow and walk in step with the Holy Spirit. Truth leads the way and experience comes. Now, praise God. He has given us His Spirit that we might experientially know His love. Know that we know that we know. I mean, what is conviction of sin but an experience of the Spirit of God acting upon you, prompting you to consider the course of your life and change your ways? What is joy but an overflow of an experience of happiness and gratitude for who God is and what He's done? What is love? What is hope? And God intends for us not just to intellectually know these things, but to experience the reality of them. But here's the key. What's the pathway to your heart? It's not to ignore the mind. It's to engage the mind. Life in the Spirit flows through the life of the mind where we think upon these things. And we we gain a biblical framework and filter and a grid by which we can test the thoughts that come our way and make them obedient to the Word of God. That we can test the ideas and the impressions and the promptings and the leadings and we can compare the, the attributes and the character qualities and the fruit right here by the Word of God. And so, how do you walk in step with the Holy Spirit? You set your mind and heart repeatedly on the things of God. You study God's Word to know, to understand His will and His way. And that's like loading the gun for the Holy Spirit to pull the trigger and fire powerful truth in your life. To take the truth from the mind and to engage the heart and to enable you to then be an instrument or a vessel to be used by God to, be, to bring blessing to others. It's not just about what we get out of this thing, right? God empowers us to live a life that glorifies Jesus and loves our neighbor, loves others, brings blessing and benefit to others. How do we know what that is? Well, the Word of God. Life in the Spirit travels through the life of the mind. In other words, many other religions, they'll tell you to empty your mind, empty your thoughts. That's not Christianity, friends. Fill your thoughts, fill your mind 
with the truth of God's word. Ruminate on God's word. Meditate on God's word day and night. Think upon these things. Cultivate and develop a sanctified imagination filled with the analogies, word pictures, stories, characters, words of scripture, and strangely find yourself hearing from and being led by the Holy Spirit. In specific situations, when a word is needed to strengthen the weary, a verse will come to your mind that comforts a friend, a coworker, a family member. It's right here. Set your mind on things of God. Study. Study the Word of God to know and to understand His will and His way. Thirdly, seek. Seek to be filled and seek the filling and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You know, in Luke's Gospel, Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. And it goes on and says, If you ask, even you as an earthly father, will you give your son a rock instead of bread? Now you give him bread. It says, so it is. The Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Paul taught the Corinthian church, who they were a little bit overboard in many ways in terms of the spirit stuff, and they kind of got in the ditch on the gifts and the power and the working of the Holy Spirit. And yet he didn't throw it out. He corrected it. He instructed it. He gave it lanes. He gave it direction. He gave it correction and instruction. And, and he went on and he told them in 1 Corinthians 14, no, seek the greater gift. Seek to be filled with and to walk in the fullness and the power and the gifting and the work of the Holy Spirit. Not for selfish gain, not for self-glory, but for the building up of the church. There's one Spirit, many gifts, diverse functions and operations, unique ways. God's wired us all so differently. I read recently, a little, little bonus here, on what are the love languages of God? We, you may be familiar with the five love languages. It's a well-known resource for marriages and relationships. And, and, uh, but this pastor was talking about what are the love languages of God? How does God speak to us? What are the ways God speaks to us? Of course, number one is Scripture. But he, wanted, he, he gives seven love languages. So he, he said desires, dreams, doors, people, promptings, and pain. I mean, God speaks to us first and foremost through His Word, by His Word. Every other way that God would speak to us should be filtered through the grid of truth, the grid of Scripture. But even C.S. Lewis said God whispers to us in our pleasure, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God has, God has spoken, and God still speaks. He is speaking, speaking through his word. He speaks through our desires and dreams and opportunities that he, doors he opens and closes. People he brings into our lives, divine contacts who at a, at a key moment in your life, the, the Spirit of God will speak through a person to perhaps direct the course of your life. Promptings, which, you know, talking about that today, how, the, how God speaks to us through our conscience or through promptings or through the voice of the Spirit and through, even through pain. And so God's wired us all so differently and He speaks through creation, we see that. He speaks through His Son, through His Word. But friends, the invitation is on the table. According to the Bible, seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ask. The Spirit of God comes. Again, giving stronger Evidence of his presence and blessing where he's needed and where he's wanted. And God is waiting for some of us, some of you to, 
ask, to seek, to pursue. Set your mind, your heart on things of God. Study His Word and seek in prayer. God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Guide me, lead me, direct me. All on the foundation through the filter of the Word of God. Open my ears, open my eyes, give me a sensitivity to what you're doing in this specific moment and situation. And Lord, whatever you have for me. And there's, and there's no one particular gift or experience that all will have or share. It's diverse. But it's there to be sought for, sought after. The Spirit goes where He's needed, where He's wanted. So, set your mind, your heart, and things of God. Study the Word of God. Seek the filling and fullness of the Spirit. And fourthly, one of my favorite, which kind of got me uh, on this track, right here from uh, Ephesians 5, sing. Sing and make music to the Lord in your hearts. I mean, when, when, when you read here, back to our text in Ephesians 5, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. I mentioned the last couple weeks, I was on the drive home from Montana in the car and the worship music was playing. And as the words of the song were being spoken to me and being sung over me, and as I began to sing, the truth about who God is, what He's doing. Again, the Spirit of God began filling my mind and my heart. How do you walk in step with the Holy Spirit? How do you be filled with the Holy Spirit? How do you access that? Friends, God has designed singing as a pathway and as a faucet to fill His people with the Spirit. Worship in song, praise in song is a powerful means of filling the mind and the heart with a sense of the nearness and the active presence and blessing and truth of the Holy Spirit. Man, in these days, I'm, I, I'm cranking it up. In our household, we, we've got that Grace City playlist, and go to YouTube and pull up the song and pop it on and crank it up and let the praise and exaltation of Jesus fill your home and enter in in singing. Praise is both the overflow of the filling of the, of the Spirit, but not just the overflow. It's also the pathway. It's also the faucet by which we're filled with the Spirit. A uh, good friend of, of ours, a pastor, described an experience when he was visiting some brothers and sisters in the faith in Africa. And, and if you've ever, ever had the opportunity to be there, uh, you, you, you see the joy and the exuberance, even in poverty or persecution and difficult situations. And the believers sing with such joy. And his was, experience, he, he saw this and, and was asking questions and talking to him about this. And, and, the, and they said to him, brother, we sing when we're happy. We sing when we're not happy. And when we're not happy, we sing until we get happy. <laughs> and friends, there's truth in that. Those who've walked with God throughout history talk about praying until you pray. Like, like pressing through the noise of the mind and the heart where it's, the, it's words and it's and pray until there's a sense of the nearness of God with you upon your mind and upon your heart. Now in faith, we trust God. Hears us, we know, we push through that. We pray until we pray. Same in song. We sing until we sing. We worship until we worship. We praise until we praise. And friends, that is an incredible blessing and means of accessing the filling of the Holy Spirit. Sincere, intentional, truth-filled song and praise awakens the heart and soul. And so my encouragement to you and I 
is to make worship, make praise a lifestyle, a habit. And now, now I know some of you already lost you because you're like, sing, oh man, that's not my thing, right? Like I don't, I don't do the sing thing. I can't sing. You don't want me singing anywhere near you. All right, and you know, there's the classic church joke, make a joyful noise, you know, okay, I, I, I'll jump in on that, but eh. Listen, God's, you want, you want to walk in step with the Holy Spirit, right? Notice it says, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. <laughs> so when you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, what a, an incredible gift and pathway is song, is singing. It says, go on being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to, another, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go on being filled with the Holy Spirit, singing. Sing. What a gift. What a gift. How do you walk in step with the Spirit? How do you be filled with the Spirit? Set your mind. Study the Word. Seek the filling of the Holy Spirit. And sing. Fifthly, and conversely, the invitation to sit still. One of the ways to cultivate a sensitivity to the work and the voice of the Spirit is to enter into the quietness and calmness of prayer and of trust and of waiting. Stop and listen in prayer. How do you hear the Holy Spirit? Well, you have to spend some time listening. Sit still long enough to actually listen. This is certainly true in our day and age with the noise coming at us, to turn off the devices, the screens, to fill your mind with the truth of God's Word, and to spend time listening and cultivating a sanctified imagination. The Bible tells us, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And quietness and repentance is your salvation. Uh, there's a story in 1 Samuel chapter 3 of the Lord calling the young Samuel, the great Old Testament prophet. And he was hearing the Lord call him at night. And he would get up and he'd go to Eli and he'd say, you called me? He said, I didn't call you, go back to bed. You called me? I didn't call you, go back to bed. And the third time, finally, Eli catches on and he says, hey, next time, <laughs> he realizes it's the Lord calling this this young man. It's the Lord speaking to this boy. Next time, he says, listen when he calls your name. And so Samuel says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. <laughs> you ever prayed that prayer? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You quiet your mind and your heart to hear the call of God. To hear the call and invitation of the Holy Spirit. The great prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 19. After the great victory on Mount Carmel, he's running for his life and hiding out in a cave. And the Lord wants to meet with him. The Bible tells us there was a great wind that shook the mountain. The Lord was not in the wind. Then came an earthquake that shook the mountain. The Lord was not in the earthquake. Then came a fire. The Lord was not in the fire. And then came a still small voice. A gentle whisper. And Elijah went out and stood at the mouth of the cave and met with the Lord. I have, for 20 years, I've had in my Bible this little piece of paper right there in 1 Kings 19. T 
to see the wonders, to feel the wind, to taste the wine, to hear the whisper. And that one circled. The Lord wasn't in the dramatic display of power that day. He was in the still small voice. And so there are times where the Lord may fill your heart, your mind. You may have the sails of your soul filled with the wind of the Spirit when you're pouring out your heart in song and you're singing to the Lord. And There may be times when the noise stops. And in the stillness, and in the quiet, you hear God calling to you. You see, the Bible says, let's be Bible, let's be Bible, let's go by the Word. The Word says that the Spirit will testify with our spirits that we are sons and daughters of God. So the Bible says that the Spirit of God will speak to you and tell you you're mine. You belong to me. I'm my beloved's and he is mine. And his banner over me is love. Yeah, that's something the Spirit might say if you listen. And when you know that that's what his word says, you know what to listen for. <laughs> and the Spirit of God can speak in the stillness and the quietness. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46.10 Or last one, this one, and then we're, 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 we're nearing the end of my seven here this morning for you if you're still... With me, Isaiah chapter 50. I love this. I had this written on the back of that little piece of paper, actually. And it's speaking of Jesus, ultimately, who fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah here. In Isaiah 50, the sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning. Wakens my ear. To listen like one being taught. <laughs> Imagine the fellowship that Jesus had in the morning with the Holy Spirit. There's a reason Jesus went off to a solitude place to pray, meet with the Father and with the Spirit. And friends, the same Holy Spirit that empowered Jesus in his earthly life and ministry is given to you to empower you in Christ, the Spirit of God. What would it be like to be wakened morning by morning as one who has an ear to listen like one being taught? How do you walk in step with the Holy Spirit? Well, sometimes you got to sit still. you got to listen. Set your minds on the things above, on things of God. Study God's Word to know His will and His way. Seek the filling and fullness of the Spirit. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Sit still and stop and listen in prayer. And sixthly, submit. Practice submission to spiritual authority in your life. Huge issue that we don't have time to fully unpack, but briefly as you practice submitting to spiritual authority, there's a humility there. And when we walk in step with the Spirit, we cultivate this attitude of submission. Notice it says even here in, in Ephesians 5, where we were, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so a part of being filled with the Holy Spirit is this posture of humility and 
to submit. And so we see even in the New Testament that, that who is the one who hears from God? Who is the one that walks in tune and in step with the Holy Spirit? It's not the one who barges in and says, you know, hey, I've got a, I've got a word and you need to do this and you need to do that. And the Spirit told me and I've got a prophecy of this and that, whatever. It's like, OK, let's test and check the fruit of the attitude and the fruit of the, of, of the life of, of what's behind that. No, no, no. Rather, it's, well, let, hey, you know what? I, I think, I think the Lord was telling me this, but, you know, I'm going to submit that to the test of his word. And then I'm going to submit that idea, that thought, you know, should I go here or there? I'm going to submit that to, to counsel in my life, to spirit pastors and leaders and spiritual authority in my life. I'm, I'm going to submit this like, hey, does this, does this pass the sniff test? You know, I mean, would you weigh this? And we're going to submit even to one another. Like, hey, I, man, you know, if God brings to my mind a verse, a thought, an idea to encourage you, I want to say, hey, submit that for your consideration, for your encouragement, for your, to, to strengthen you and build you up. But like, it's between you and the Lord to test and weigh whether or not this is true. And and Jesus said, wisdom is proved right by her actions. Wisdom is proved right by her children. Wisdom is proved right by the fruit. And sometimes we only know whether or not it actually was the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us and speaking to us after the fact. In hindsight, you look back, you go, yeah, I think, that's, I think that was the Holy Spirit. Because the fruit was God's kind of fruit. So we submit. We submit and we walk under spiritual authority in order to walk in spiritual authority. Huge key principle of the Christian life. You want to walk in step with the Holy Spirit? You want to walk in tune with the Holy Spirit? You want to be a vessel and an instrument God can entrust with these kinds of active blessings and ministry, then be one who is practicing submission and walking in submission to the Spirit, in submission to spiritual authority, humility, repentance. The, the, in the book of Acts, it, said, it seemed right to us in the Holy Spirit. Like, we're going to submit this as a possibility that this might be the Spirit, and we're not going to bat a thousand. Again, everyone's got static on the line. We're not going to hit it perfect, but we're going to walk in humility and we're going to submit. And that's a way to step in tune and in line with the Holy Spirit. You're going to submit yourself. You're going to submit your body to the Spirit as instruments of righteousness. Take my life. You know, I submit myself to you. I'm, I'm available. I'm available, but I'm not pushing it. Let you lead. Submit. James tells us, James 3, that the wisdom that comes from above is pure and peace-loving and submissive. Like if you want to know, you have wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Wis wisdom is an interesting, interesting thing, right? Knowledge, knowledge of word, but you need wisdom to know how to apply the principle, the truth, the Word of God in particular situations and times and settings in your life at decision points. And I mean, if you're a young person and you're trying to discover God's will for your life and find the path where God wants you to go, like wisdom, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, we need the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom. And what is that? That's, well, maybe it's this way. Maybe it's that way. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's that. Wisdom from above, it's submissive. It's like, okay, I can hold some of this loosely. And I don't have to live in fear of getting it just right. And I can then, seventh, the last step, step out in faith, acting in obedience upon the Word of God and the leading of the Spirit, the voice of the Spirit in my life. I can go for it. And, and see and practice what it would look like to be filled with and led by the Spirit in practice, whether that's through 
the thought, the idea in my mind, a, a, a specific verse or a prompting, a leading, an idea, a suggestion of like, where did that come? Might that have been the Holy Spirit? And might following through on that lead to some exciting ministry opportunity or blessing? It's, it's why, you know, we talk about send that text, check in with that person, pick up the phone, call. If the Spirit of God is leading you, if you think He might be leading you to have that conversation, you, you have the, the grid in your mind and your heart. Of, is this something the Spirit of God would say or lead me to do? Is it loving? Is it building somebody up? Is it truthful? Is it in line with His Word? And if it is, well, go for it. Step out in faith, in obedience, to act upon the leading of the Holy Spirit. Friends, the, the church that Jesus is building is a Spirit-filled, Spirit-led, Spirit-obedient church. The building is not going to make Disciples, you and I are. As we walk in step with the Holy Spirit, as we learn to follow Jesus, as we walk in tune, as our hearts are filled with the truth and the promises of God, and as we boldly, courageously, humbly, submissively step out in faith, and build relationships and love in word and deed, listen and act upon the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We, we need the Holy Spirit. What an exciting day to be alive. What an exciting movement to be a part of the movement of Jesus Christ in the world today, in this generation, in this moment in time, in your lifetime, you have a choice of how to live your life. Are you going to set your mind and your heart on the things of God? Give yourself to study, to know the will of God. Seek to be filled with His Spirit. Sing to the Lord. Sit still with Him in prayer. Submit to Him and to spiritual authority in your life and then step out. Step out in faith. Um, so, one story and, and we'll be done. Um, here I am and met Howe uh, years ago as a new, brand new Christian, 19 years old. I was in Wenatchee and and uh, I was stepping away from my old lifestyle and learning to and beginning to seek to know God and to walk with God and desire to live for God and to walk this new path in relationship with Jesus. And it's a Saturday night and, and I kind of avoided the, the party scene that night and finished a paper I was writing for school and I'm lying in my bed and it's two, three in the morning, and uh, this thought pops in my head out of nowhere. Get up, drive to Pateras, surprise your parents, and go to church with them. <laughs> like, like, what, a, what a crazy, weird, random, out of nowhere idea pops in my head, and I push it out, push it out, try to fall back asleep, can't sleep, can't sleep, so I finally, I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, well, I think maybe that's the Lord calling me to do that. So I get up and uh, pack a little bag and go for a drive in the early morning hours. And uh, it was an incredible drive, just in, you know, praying and can't believe how my life is changing and what God's done in my life. And I get to Pateras and I stop to have my favorite breakfast, biscuits and gravy. 
Um, and uh, at the Superstop, I'm serious. It's an amazing place, really. You should go there someday. But uh, have breakfast, and I go out to head to my car, and I look up at my parents' house, which I can see across the highway there, and uh, it's way early for them, but I can see they're getting in the car and they're beginning to leave to drive to go to church. And I'm like, wait a minute, church doesn't start yet. This is weird. Why are, why are they leaving so early to go to church? So I, I run out towards the highway. I flag my, I wave my arms. I flag them down. Mind you, this is, I don't know, six, seven in the morning. I've, I've, it's early. It's in the morning, Sunday morning. And they, they see me, thankfully. They turn around. They come. They pull into the, the parking lot there and uh, they roll down the window. And I look at them and I say, what are you doing? And they, they look at me like, uh, what are you doing? And I noticed they were really dressed up nice, like nicer than, than they would normally dress up to come go to church. And uh, I said, <laughs> the craziest thing, I, I couldn't sleep. I, I, I felt like the Lord said, get up, go to Pateras, surprise your parents and go to church with them. And they started they started crying, like tears in her eyes. And I'm like, whoa, so what's, what's with the nice dress? And what, you know, they said, well, we didn't, we hadn't told you boys, you know, we hadn't told anyone, but your, your mom and I are renewing our vows this morning in church. <laughs> so at 19 years old, I, I got ready, came to church, stood right here, or I sat right over there. <laughs> they stood right here and renewed their vows. And they, they just celebrated last week, 52 years of marriage, by the way. Happy anniversary, mom, dad. They're now here in Wenatchee, part of Grace City Church. And uh, I'm grateful that they brought me here and gave me a place for the word of God to be put and stacked in my mind and my heart so that one day the Holy Spirit would throw the match and light that truth on fire in a way that would change my heart and change my life. Preached my first sermon in this pulpit and have endeavored to, by God's grace, walk in step with the Holy Spirit. And of course, have failed many, many times. In step, out of step. But I tell that story about, it's like the fruit of that was an incredible blessing to them, an incredible blessing to me. That had I just, you know, not given that a consideration or acted upon that, I would have missed out on. That was a huge, for me as a young believer, even an affirmation that God cares and is intimately involved and speaks to us and will prompt us and lead us and guide us in ways that will bolster our faith and bless others. And what a, what a, what a, what a gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and I want to walk in that more on the foundation of the truth and to be sensitive to be to hear and to act upon the prompting and the leading of the spirit to be filled with the spirit that would come out of my life and bear the fruit even looking back of yeah you know what i i that sounds like that that was the spirit of god leading you to say that to do that I'll close with this. Isaiah 30. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for Him. O people of Zion, who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. How gracious He will be when you cry for help. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes, you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Friends, my prayer for you and I as the people of Grace City Church 
people who endeavor to know God, to walk with God, to be filled with His Spirit, to be led by His Spirit, to walk in step with His Holy Spirit, is that we would be a people who hear the voice behind us saying, this is the way. Walk in it. And that we would be led by, in step with it. And we would cultivate a sweetness and a graciousness and a freedom and a fluidity and a flow be known as a people who bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, who walk in tune and in step, who are filled with praise and thanksgiving to God, waving the Jesus flag for generations to come and seeing the Spirit of God transform more lives and more hearts. And so, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would use your word, use this word to instruct and equip your sons and your daughters, that we might hear your voice and walk with you. That you might fill us to overflowing. Lord, that you might teach us what it looks like for each one of us to pursue life in step with the Holy Spirit. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for tuning in this morning and joining us. Pastor Josh will be back with us next Sunday. You won't want to miss it. God bless you, Grace City. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.